Here's question 8 then, you're given this diagram here, which is a circle inscribed inside a square. You're told the area of the square is 16 centimeters squared, and you have to find, first of all, the radius length of that circle. With this question, you want to be thinking about what lengths you have here. So what is the length of this side that makes the square of, 80, of area 16 centimeters squared? What is the radius of this circle, and how do those two lengths compare? Of course, since this circle is exactly inscribed within the square, in that um, these point, this point here and each of the other points where the circle touches the, the square uh, are only exactly at one point, and the, the edges of the circle are tangential to the circle. That's, that's what's me meant by um, inscription, or it's one of the it's one of the side effects of inscription. So of course this length here, being the diameter of the circle, is also the length of one of the sides of the square. So to find the radius then you know is half the diameter, so that's the kind of thing that you're going to be working with with this question. What we need to do right away is to get some numbers involved, because we want to get up, we want to get a number at the end. We, the only number we're given is the area of the square. So we need to find some other way of writing the area of the square. Well, if the length of one of the sides is d, then the area of the square is d squared. So you can write that d squared is equal to 16 centimeters squared. That means that d is 4 centimeters. Uh, it could be, well, I mean, in a purely mathematical sense, it could be minus 4 centimeters either. But of course, since we're talking about lengths here, they're always positive. So 4 centimeters is the only possible option, and for that reason we can have the mutual implication symbol there as well. Um, so if, the, if d is 4 centimeters, then the radius is half of that, or d over 2, so it's 2 centimeters. In the next part of the question we have to find the area of the shaded region, which I've colored here in green. Um, you have to find the area in centimeters squared correct to one decimal place. Uh, well. First of all, think about what areas can you actually find out with the dimensions we have. We now know d, the length of one of the sides, uh, which is also the diameter of the circle. We have the radius of the circle. So what kind of things can you actually work out with that information? And how can you use that information to then find the area of the shaded region? Without actually putting any numbers in, I know this formula here will work. That the area of the shaded region is equal to the area of the square minus the area of the circle. And the reason that works is that the shaded region is all, you can think of it almost like a Venn diagram, that there is this area of the square here, and there's the area of a circle takes up some amount of that. So the area that isn't in the circle then is the area that's shaded. So take the area of the square, that's this whole thing. Take away this area, the circle, and all the bits you're left with make up the rest of the area of the square, and those make up all the shaded bits. Um, you could also be asked, for example, let's say only three of these bits are shaded, or only two, or only one bit shaded, and for that you, you're going to use fairly similar things you talk about. Um, let's say you, you've only got two shaded areas, then you want to find half the, the area of half the circle, you find the area of this rectangle here rather than the square, that kind of thing. And uh, you, you'll come up with pretty much the, the same kind of formulas that you're taking the larger area and then taking away the, the smaller area. Just to continue that on then, the area of the square is 16, which we were told at the very beginning of this question. The area of the circle is given by pi r squared, or a half tau r squared if you're uh, so inclined. Then you follow that on, you get 16 minus 4 pi, because the 2 squared is 4, and put that in a calculator and you get 3.4 centimeters squared. Part B, you're given this diagram here, or something very similar to it, and this diagram has various horizontal and vertical lines on it, uh, and in the first part of the question, you have to find the lengths of the horizontal line, this one here, and the offsets, those are each of the vertical lines here, uh, of which there are five. 
and you take each grid unit as five millimeters. That is the distance across one of these squares. I don't know how, how well they're showing up on the camera. Uh, the distance across one of these squares here is five millimeters and you have to record those lengths on the diagram itself. Might be able to do this one with a ruler. Uh, on my printout of the the exam paper, it wasn't exactly five millimeters across here, so I had to actually count the squares instead of just measuring the lengths. Um, it may be that the, the ones you get in the exam are slightly better quality, um, and there actually will be five millimeters here, and you can actually just measure the lengths. Um, but to just be on the safe side, you're better off counting the squares and then working out the length that way. So for example, if we go trying to go from this point here up to here, we're counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven squares at five millimeters per square. That works out as 35 millimeters. And you do that for each of the vertical lines and just the one horizontal line. You don't need to break it up into these uh, four block sets of lines. So uh, as I say this length here is 35. This one here there are four blocks underneath the horizontal line and five blocks above so that's nine and nine times five is 45 millimeters. Uh, this vertical line has six blocks below and six blocks above so that's 12 times five which is 60. This is five and three so eight times five is 40. And this is 4 and 4, which is 8. 8 times 5 is 40. And don't forget the horizontal line as well. That is 24 blocks across. 24 times 5 is 120 millimeters. Um, with the vertical lengths, you probably could just measure them and they'll be f you'll get pretty much the right answer. Um, there would it's unlikely that there's enough of there would be enough of an error in the printing that you would get too far away from it. But with this 121, that's probably long enough that you might be able to get um, 115 or 125 millimeters instead or something like that. So um, you're, you're probably better off actually counting the boxes and um, multiplying by 5 millimeters that way. In part 2 you had to use Simpson's rule to estimate the area of the shape. This is Simpson's rule here. It's on page 12 of the Formula and Tables book in the area approximation section. Uh, be careful you don't use the trapezoidal rule, there's two on that page. Um, so Simpson's rule says um, that you take h over 3, h being the distance between horizontal, the horizontal distance between um, adjacent offsets, these vertical lines. So that's 20 millimeters there. You take y1 as being the height of the first offset. Um, just be careful you don't take 35 for this, you take this offset here which is zero. When I say that you're taking zero for that it may sound like it won't make a difference but actually if you take zero but if you take 35 as being your first offset and 40 as being your last offset then your your answer is actually going to be off by about 30 percent so that's pretty significant. So you take zero as being your first offset and zero as being your last offset that's y1 and yn. Uh, the y3, y5, y7 and so on they're multiplied by two they're going to be then the 45 and the 40. There's only two of those. And it's four times all the even offsets, which are going to be the 35, the 60, and the 40 millimeters. Just input everything in the formula then. As I say, y1 and yn, that's uh, the first offset and the last offset, are 0 and 0. Uh, the odd offsets are 45 and 40. And the even offsets are 35, 60, and 40. Follow the maths through and you get 4733. Three. Um, if you had 35 as being your first offset and 40 as being your last offset, then uh, you're going to get about 3100 or something along those lines. So it's going to be quite significantly different. So just that's just something to be careful of when you're actually doing this question. In part C, you're given this diagram here uh, of a wax candle. You're told that the diameter of the base is three centimeters because this is a, a cylinder here and a cone so they have a diameter um, and you're told that the height of the cylinder part of it is eight centimeters and you're told the volume of wax in the entire candle that's included the cylinder and the cone the total volume of wax is 21 pi centimeters cubed 
and you have to find the height of the candle. What I'm going to do is call the height of the cone L and the height of the entire candle lambda. So lambda is what we're looking for in the end. If all we're given is two lengths here and the volume of the entire candle, then what we're going to have to do is find some way to relate what we do know to what we don't know. And to do that, you're going to have to compare the vo what you do know, the volume of the candle, um, with whatever you can work out the volume of the candle to be using your formulas and the lengths that you're given, and hopefully that will give you what you're looking for in the end. Without actually throwing any numbers in there, first of all, I can say that the volume of the entire candle is the sum of the volumes of the two individual bits, the cylinder here and the cone that's up here. Uh, of course, the reason you do that is because it's very difficult to mix the volumes of two different shapes like that. So you're just simply going to have to work them out separately and then try and add them together in the end. So I throw in absolutely everything I know. The volume of the candle is 21 pi, which you're given at the very start of the question. The volume of a cylinder is given by pi r squared h, which is just going to be in your formula and tables book. And the volume of a cone is going to be pi over 3 r squared h. Uh, and the reason that I called these two lengths l and lambda as opposed to h and capital h or something like that is because in our formulas we've got radiuses and we've got h's. And of course these two h's are different so th there's a little bit of confusion there. If you, could, if you want to do it in your own exam then by all means um, as long as you can make sense of what you're writing it makes absolutely no difference what you call these lengths. It's just for a bit of clarity that I'm calling them L and Lambda. The The radius in both these cases is the same. Um, it may not be true for all questions you're given, but in this case, yes, those two radii are the same, but those two H's are different. So following that through, we get the 21 pi is equal to pi times 1.5 squared. Remember, you're given diameter here, not radius, so your radius is half of that, which is 1.5. So 1.5 squared times 8, the height, plus pi over 3 times 1.5 squared times L. And again, this this is just right from the formula and tables book. So follow that through and you get down to here. You can move that 18 pi over to this side. Or you can take 18 pi from both sides, whichever way you prefer to think of it. So you get 3 pi is equal to 3 quarters L pi, which means that L is 4 centimeters. Now we're only that only works out this length here L. We have to work out this length lambda. The last bit is fairly trivial then. We know that lambda is the height of the entire candle, and the candle is made up of these two different heights, H and L. Uh, so we know that lambda is A plus L. We just worked out that L is four centimeters, so lambda then is twelve centimeters. In part two, you're told that nine of these candles fit into a rectangular box. Um, the base of the box is a square, and you have to find the volume of the smallest rectangular box that the candles will fit into. Well, I can tell you just right away, this is the answer here. When your candles are laid up straight like that, and you have three in a row and three in each column, um, then that's going to get you the smallest volume. The actual numerical volume for that then is the product of each of the dimensions of the box. So this length here is 9 because each of these uh, diameters is 3 centimeters and there are 3 of those so we get 9. It's 9 centimeters in this direction as well and we worked out the height of the candle that's sort of going uh, in into and out of the page is 12 centimeters. So the product of those 3 gets you 972 centimeters cubed. Um, and it's worth knowing that this sort of configuration is going to be the smallest volume. A cuboid is the sort of most efficient, in quotes, uh, volume of a rectangular box, uh, of all of the rectangular boxes. Um, so the closer you can get to a cuboid, the more efficient, again, in quotes, uh, the volume is going to be. Um, so this is the closest you're going to get to a cuboid, a cube where all your dimensions are fairly similar um, and so the closer you can get to that the, the smaller the volume is going to be so that's this is the configuration you want. There are other ways to answer this question though um, which I'll go through just to show you you have other options. 
there are loads of ways of laying out these candles so they fit the conditions. For example, you can lay them out like that uh, in a box. So for, you have this length here as being 12. So since the base of the box has to be a square, you need to have 12 in this direction as well. And you'll get a box that way. And I'll go through that situation in a minute. You could lay them out, say, like that. Um, and of course you would need uh, another candle here and another candle there and whatever way um again but you, you're going to need to make sure that you have a square base in this case it's going to be 15 by 15 uh, because you're going to have 12 from this candle and then another three from the other candle you could lay them out end to end like that so the, the base of your box is 24 centimeters and so on all of these are going to be uh, less efficient in quotes than this configuration here because this is the closest one to a cube or well closest one that really as a sphere is the most efficient shape of all but when you're talking about rectangular boxes a cube is the most efficient shape let me just go into detail about one of these scenarios then where you have the, the candles laid out like this uh, on their sides because this length is 12 centimeters then this length also has to be 12 centimeters uh, it may be that uh, the candles won't fit exactly um, in the other direction as well for example, if uh, the candles are two and a half centimeters in diameter, then you're going to have four candles of two and a half centimeters, which are ten. Then you're going to have two centimeters left over at the end that you can't fill with any other candles. It just so happens in this case that um, those there are three centimeters in diameter, so four of them will fit uh, exactly into the, the square box uh, that way. Uh, this is a look from the side. Um, it's in terms of this diagram, there should be another candle here, but I actually moved it up there just to make a, a particular point that even though there is this gap here, so technically you could move that side in to try and make the shape a bit more efficient. The fact that you're told the base of the box is a square means that you need to have this length uh, to be 12 as well. Um, and in fact, even if you did move this side in, um, the volume is still going to be about 1033, which is still larger than the volume of this configuration here.